now Matt Hammer and Andrew Miller, and uh, Kevin will be giving the talk. Thanks. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here in my hometown to tell you about ILC, which is our new process calculus for cryptography. And this is joint work with Andrew, my advisor from UIEC, and Matt Hammer from Dfinity. So cryptography is important as ever. We use cryptography when we buy things from Amazon. We use it when we message our friends and family. And now we even use it to speculate with our life savings. And so for things that are so widely used and really ought to be secure, sadly they aren't. Every year we hear about more and more severe cryptographic flaws. And there are a lot of things that can go wrong with cryptography, including buggy implementations, side channels. But the flaws that I'm really referring to are flaws in the underlying constructs themselves, so bugs in the proofs of security for these schemes. And I think that there's a simple root cause in that cryptography and security proofs are just really difficult to write, even for experts. And so there's an area called computer-aided cryptography that looks to address some of these issues. And the idea is that we want to get a computer to check our proofs for us. There's been a lot of excellent work in this area. Tools usually fall into one of two camps. The first is the symbolic model of cryptography, where we take a high-level abstract view of protocols and we can benefit from a lot of automation. And the other camp is the computational model, which is our focus. And the idea is to formalize and mechanize the kind of low-level reasoning that cryptographers use when they write these proofs. And so there's been a lot of success stories using computational tools. I'll just name a few. Um, researchers have looked at multi-party computation protocols. They've looked at Signal. And probably the most notable effort is Project Everest, which aims to build an end-to-end -end verified implementation of HTTPS. So that includes a mechanized security proof for TLS. I really believe that there's a lot of, to be excited about in this area. I think we'll have mechanized security proofs for a lot of primitives and protocols we care about. But we've identified a sort of large uh, limitation of current tools in that the security notions you can prove using them aren't composable. And so it becomes really difficult to prove security for these really large crypto systems that have a lot of different components. And you might think, you know, TLS is already this huge effort. What do you have in mind that's bigger than TLS? What could be possibly be bigger than Everest, right? And I have an answer for you, and that answer is blockchain. So blockchain is all the rage these days. And if you look closely at some of the latest and greatest blockchain systems, you'll quickly realize that they're a complex hodgepodge of all the latest innovations in cryptography and distributed computing. So they combine things like multi-party computation, zero-knowledge proofs, and distributed consensus. Now, you don't have to know what these components are, but just know that even proving security for one of these components is non-trivial. And even if we are able to do that, this doesn't mean that when we combine them into a larger protocol that it stays secure. Cryptographers have long recognized secure composition as a really difficult problem. And indeed, uh, bad interactions can arise out of otherwise secure components. And so in cryptography, this is addressed through the theory of universal composability. I won't go into too many details, but just know that it's it's the wide, widely established standard for proving security of your schemes, and it's the gold standard. And so security, you get security under concurrent composition. So if I have a UC secure protocol, it maintains its security properties even when run arbitrarily with, concurrently with arbitrary other protocols. Right? So the, the, the good news is that UC lets us analyze complex protocols from simpler building blocks. But the bad news is that UC protocols are suffering from increasingly unwieldy formalisms. The specifications are typically written in a combination of prose and pseudocode. And the UC security proofs are often pages long and relegated to the appendices of crypto papers. And so really, you can think of UC as a modular programming framework for cryptographic pseudocode that only exists on paper. And so we want to change that. So in the Saucy project, we're looking to formalize and mechanize the UC framework. And so we want to turn pro specifications into formal ones. We want to turn pen and paper proofs into machine checkable proofs. And we want to turn the modular analysis that UC gives you and turn that into modular implementation of secure systems as well. So in this paper, we take a first step by giving a way to formally specify UC protocols and their security specifications. And so for example, we want to turn something on the left into something on the right that we can formally reason about. And to do this, we design a new process calculus called the interactive lambda calculus. So what do we really want from a UC programming language? Well, we identified two main criteria. First is that it should be able to express distributed protocols. And the second requirement is that it should be amenable to probabilistic reasoning, because when we write a proof of security, we're essentially bounding the probability that some bad event happens. And so to satisfy our first requirement, a natural choice is some kind of process calculus. And to satisfy our second requirement, we can take Two, one of two paths. Either we can design some probabilistic programming language, and we can allow processes to toss their own random coins, 
or we can design a deterministic language and we can think of the coin tosses as input and so we choose the second route so together what we're looking for is a deterministic process calculus and so our starting point is the pi calculus this has been used extensively for security analysis in the symbolic model of cryptography and so just to recap, recap um, in the pi calculus we have a notion of communication channels so here I'm doing something a little non-standard in that channels are unidirectional they have a read endpoint and they have a write endpoint and we can also have a process that's going to listen on that read endpoint and we can also have a process that's going to write on that write endpoint and so when we evaluate this program the reading process gets the value x and the writing process goes to the null process zero okay so that's great we can express distributed protocols but the problem is that pi calculus isn't confluent so if i have a pi calculus term i can evaluate it in a number of ways and get different results and because the choice of how to evaluate this program is non-deterministic, it becomes really difficult to reason about what's the probability of a certain outcome happening, right? And this, in turn, frustrates security proofs. And so we can boil down non-determinism to two main sources. Uh, one is right non-determinism. So for example, consider you have one reading process and two writing processes. Then in one valuation, you might have that the middle writing process gets the performance operation. And in another evaluation, we might have that the uh, rightmost writing process gets to perform its write operation. The other source of non-determinism is read non-determinism. So suppose you have two reading processes and one writing process. Then in one evaluation, the uh, leftmost reading process might perform its operation. And in the, another evaluation, um, the middle process might perform its read operation. And so the main idea of the interactive lambda calculus is to eliminate these two sources of non-determinism. And so our starting point is still a pi calculus-like language, but now we restrict ILC to a subset of the pi calculus using an affine type system, which means that certain resources, affine ones, can't be duplicated. And in addition to uh, type safety, ILC also enjoys confluence. So that means if we have a program when we run it on some inputs and some random coins, the choice of uh, reduction steps is inconsequential. We'll always get the same result. And so the design of our type system is really inspired by how cryptographers deal with this issue. And they deal with this using uh, what are called interactive Turing machines. So you can think of an ITM as your normal Turing machine that has a write type and a read type. And we can hook it up to another ITM and now they can talk to each other. So the thing to know about ITMs is that in a system of ITMs, exactly one process is active at any given time. And moreover, the order of activations is deterministic. So to give an example, right now the left ITM is active and it can write to the other ITM to activate it. And this ITM can write back and so the left ITM regains activation. Okay? So what we do is we take these invariants of ITMs and turn them into type level invariants. So in, to enforce that exactly one process is active at any given time, in order to perform a write operation, a process must own what we call an affine write token. And when a process uh, performs a read operation, they get it back. And so processes are going to implicitly pass around this affine write token by virtue of where their read and write effects are. And because this write token is unique, at most one of them is going to own it at any given time. And so for example, uh, programs like this where there are two writing processes don't type check because most one of them can own the write token. And so this effectively eliminates write non-determinism. And to enforce that uh, the order of activations is deterministic, uh, we turn read re channel ends into affine resources, so they can't be duplicated. And so this ensures that every write operation corresponds to a single unique read operation. And so programs like this, where we have two processes sharing the same read channel, don't type check. And this, in effect, uh, eliminates read non-determinism. And so really, we can, roughly speaking, we get that well-typed ILC programs are expressible as interactive Turing machines. So now I'm going to give a very quick tour of ILC's type system. So this is the main typing judgment, which can be read as under affine context delta and unrestricted context gamma, the expression E has type U. So here's the fork rule. So this expression says I'm going to fork a child process E1, and I'm going to continue as E2. And so the premises for this rule are going to check the fact that these have the right types. And the thing to notice is, as, standard, as a standard in sta uh, affine type systems, uh, we have to split the affine resources among the two processes. So uh, read channels and the write token can either go in E1 or E2, but not both. And here's the write rule. So this, like, operationally, this uh, expression says, I'm going to evaluate E1 to some value. I'm going to evaluate E2 to some write endpoint. And I'm going to send that value across the channel. 
So again, we have to split our affine context. And the thing to notice here is that in order to type this right expression, the process must own, first own the right token. Okay. And then finally, uh, here's the read rule. So it looks a little bit daunting, but I'll explain it piece by piece. So this is essentially a let binding. So operationally, um, we evaluate E1 to some read endpoint. And then we're going to read a value uh, off that read endpoint. And we're going to bind as x the value endpoint pair. And we're going to be able to use that in E2. And the reason that we rebind uh, the endpoint is so that we can reuse it again if we need to. And so it should be the fact that E1 should have a type of some read endpoint. And when we're typing uh, E2, uh, notice that we get the right token back. So in the body of the read expression, if we need to write, ag write again, we can do that. And we also extend the affine context with x, which is an affine pair. Uh, the first coordinate is the value that we read off the channel. And the second coordinate is uh, the, the read endpoint. All right, so now I'm going to go through uh, an example. I've given a lot of ex examples of programs that don't type check. This is one that does. So this is a commitment ide ideal functionality. And ideal functionality is really a program for a trust third, trusted third party that performs some cryptographic task uh, secure, securely by triviality. And really, we can use this as our security specification. We use it to judge the security of some protocol that doesn't rely on the ideal functionality. And we can reason that a protocol that does, uh, doesn't rely on the functionality is secure if it roughly uh, is the same as the ideal functionality. And so the details of this program aren't too uh, important, but we should at least be convinced of why it type checks. Right? So this function fcom uh, takes as a parameter uh, a read endpoint, frp. And notice that in this program, we're actually using uh, the read endpoint twice. But uh, it, this is OK, because we do rebind FRP after each use. So uh, we are using it in an affine way. And then uh, to see that the write token is being passed around appropriately, notice that uh, the reads and writes are being interleaved. And so this process is uh, alternating between uh, receiving activation and giving away. So it's passing around this write, uh, write token just fine. Finally, I want to give a recap of ILC. So the main idea of ILC is a deterministic process calculus for formalizing UC protocols and their specifications. And our way of doing this is to say that well-type programs are expressible as interactive Turing machines. And we have to satisfy the two invariants of ITMs. The first is that at most one process is active at any given time. And we do this using the affine write token. And second, we want that the sequence of activations is deterministic. And we enforce this using affine read endpoints. Okay, So now I want to put things into perspective. I think we have a long journey ahead of us. Um, this is a picture of Olympus Mons. This is the tallest mountain in our solar system. Um, so right now, we're kind of at the foothills of this giant mountain. And in this paper, we made a first step in giving away of how to formally write down UC protocols and their specs. And notice that even to take this first step, uh, required finicking with some fairly low-level details. And we take a second step in our paper by developing some of the UC-specific meta theory in ILC. So for example, we implement what's called the UC execution model in ILC. We give a security uh, definition. We give a composition theorem and prove it. And we also go through some examples. And so a huge next step will be to be able to formalize and mechanize the uh, reasoning required for these UC proofs. I do want to give a shout out to some concurrent work that's being presented at uh, CSF this week that makes some good uh, headway on these problems. And I think the, the final summit push is to somehow get cryptographers to use these tools as well. So I think we have to somehow inject affine type theory into the bloodstreams of cryptographers, and maybe they'll think about using these. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm Zhong Shao from Yale University. Uh, so I'm curious whether you have tied these uh, specification to some actual implementation. Yeah, so far, so far we haven't done that. Right now we're just looking at protocols in the abstract. Okay. And you mentioned you try to you know, make things deterministic, but uh, in practice, of course, things are not deterministic. Do you have some kind of a oracle to choose from, or when you want to read them, all kinds of uh, scenarios. Right, so the, the programming language is deterministic, but we can uh, pass in random bit strings as input. 
and that's how we uh, that's use how do you get back the right items. right exactly all right Um, so let me ask you a question. So um, affine types can be tricky to program with. Right. Uh, and so I wonder, um, I, I mean, you, you said you've only taken a first step, but I wonder if you foresee any uh, challenges where the using affine types is going to get in the way, or is it that because of these particular systems are designed with this kind of reasoning in mind that it should work okay. Right. So, um, so I guess we support a kind of like lightweight form of affine, affine types. Really, the only affine resources are this uh, write token and these read channels. So it's not like full blown uh, affine types. Um, but I think that intuitively, at least cryptographers, when they write these protocols and specifications, at least in prose in their papers, at least try to keep this execution semantics of um, functionalities and specifications in mind. So hopefully, it's not too much of a stretch to move to something like ILC. Thanks. James McKenna, LFCS in Edinburgh. Um, can you compare the design of ILC with session typed functional languages like GV and EGV, which come from similar motivations and lead to a deterministic lambda calculi, but with read-write effects and you know proper coordination between them? Yeah. Um, so we, we, we thought about using session types. We found that they were mm -hmm. a little bit restrictive, bec um, huh. and that uh, if we're going to get cryptographers to use uh, some type language, maybe we should just stick to something simpler like affine types. And maybe in the future we can look at how to integrate session types into it as well. But I agree that there's you know lots of ways we can give a type, a type system for a process calculus that's deterministic. This is just one path that we've explored so far. OK. Yeah. Follow up question How do you handle failure in the protocol? Failure in a protocol? Um, failure, do you have an? Anything in mind? Well, in, the, in the sense that a read, a read may fail, a write may fail. It may be intercepted. You know, it may be. Um, yeah. So I have to get a little bit into UC. So in UC, um, the security definition has this quantified adversary, which controls how messages are uh, delayed, or how messages don't get to where they are, or how processes are corrupted. So they're all encapsulated by this uh, explicit adversary process. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Have any more questions? We have time for one or two more. Kathleen was very specific about the length of time, so all the speakers are terrified that they'll go over. So that's why everybody said it. Um, but so let me ask one other question. Um, so you, um, I was curious. So you now have these specifications of these protocols, but the protocols are used inside a larger software system. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if you've thought about using whatever assumptions the protocols are making about how that larger system is using them to then check that the larger system is actually using them correctly, that they're not like violating, you know, like you're not allowed to do X, Y, and Z when you use this, uh, this kind of uh, system. Uh, potentially. So I mean, um, I mean, you could give like a laundry list of things that, of security violations that, you know, shouldn't happen when you compose these protocols, but it's really hard to figure out like, well, okay, when is this list done? So the idea of, um, you see, and simulation proofs is just to give this centralized specification, um, and that's simple to reason about, and that we can combine in new ways to build bigger protocols. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you.